All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Barry Helms, the Director of Archives and Library over at Rinalda House. Um, so thank you for having me today to talk about the five row community at Rinalda. It's a lesser known part of Rinalda's story, but from 1912 through the 1950s, black men and women navigated Rinalda's segregated spaces, farming the land, constructing buildings, and working as domestic staff. Um, so Catherine Smith married R.J. Reynolds in 1905, and then the very next year, Catherine began buying up land that would eventually become the 1,026 acres of Rinalda. Um, Catherine intended Rinalda to be a progressive farm and dairy where local farmers could come and learn the newest techniques in scientific agriculture, dairying, livestock management, and horticulture. Um, the farm operated this way under Catherine's direction from 1912 until her death in 1924. Um, so Rinalda as a working est estate existed in the time of Jim Crow. So in 1912, the same year that construction began at Rinalda, a residential segregation order was enacted in Winston-Salem. So while technically outside of Winston-Salem city limits and therefore not subject to municipal laws, Ronaldo was not exempt from Jim Crow. Um, segregation, anti-black laws, and the exploitation of black labor affected the lives of everyone at Ronaldo, where housing and schools were segregated and jobs were often divided along racial lines. Um, RJ and Catherine Reynolds, by virtue of being white, wealthy, and of high social status, were the beneficiaries of and often participants in this racialized culture. So when fully operational, Ronalda employed over 100 men and women, and several dozen families lived on the estate, some of those for many decades. In 1915, Catherine began setting aside land for black farm workers, and the first families moved there in 1916. So this is a plan of Ronalda from 1925, and then it was corrected in 1927. And so this shows where Renal, well, five row is located right here. And then of course here is campus now. So five row gets its name because it originally consisted of two rows of five houses with a larger boarding house for multiple families and a two room building that served as a school and church. In addition to lasting employment, Ronaldo provided fresh food, two churches, two schools, and recreation in the form of fishing, swimming, outdoor sports, uh, tennis, volleyball, um, polo that some white workers participated in, and a baseball team for black workers. On the farm, management positions went to white workers, but other positions were filled by both white and black workers. Um, wages for various skill levels were the same for both white and black employees. Um, for the average farm worker, wages began at $7.50 a week, and they went up to $18 a week by 1940. Uh, for the time, Ronaldo did pay good wages, better than what farm workers and tenant farmers could earn elsewhere. Um, Ellis Pledger traveled 20 miles a day to make $9 a week three times the pay he had been earning. In 1916, he moved to Five Row with his life, wife, Flora, who described their new home as the best place I'd ever seen. Catherine increased wages with regularity and gave generous Christmas presents that in some years included cash. Uh, for management positions, Catherine hired college-educated white men to oversee the management of crops and to supervise the laborers and gardeners who sowed and harvested field crops and tended to the livestock, orchards, vineyards, and greenhouse. Uh, this is A.C. Wharton. He was a graduate of NC State, and he was the longtime farm superintendent. He made weekly reports to Catherine about the farm, and she would often accompany him as he made his rounds. Um, that is his dog, Frank, and so a little um, random Ronalda trivia. Um, when I started at Ronalda, I found a tombstone for our beloved dog Frank and I was like who is Frank so Frank was buried with a tombstone where Summit School is located and when they were doing construction they gave us back his his grave marker uh, Robert Conrad started at Ronalda in 1913 when he was only 17 by World War I he was the head gardener and landscape supervisor he worked at Ronalda through the 1950s when he started his own landscaping business with offices located in Ronaldo Village. 
Uh, TJ Monroe was another graduate of NC State and he was hired to manage the dairy. Um, the dairy was a very forward facing part of the farm. It was the location for several community demonstrations during World War I when there was a fear of food shortages. Um, so early jobs for black workers included draining ditches and the construction of Lake Catherine. Um, this involved moving the stones to be used for the lake bridge and walls. Um, the overflow on the Ronalda, side, Ronalda Road side of the lake actually became the community pool used by both black and white workers. Um, according to several oral histories, this space was also used for five road baptisms. Other early jobs for black workers were clearing, clearing the land and laying the foundations for the first buildings. This included housing for both black and white workers. So before Five Row was built, there were three dwellings like boarding houses to house black workers. These buildings had a living room, a kitchen, and sleeping quarters. Uh, the individual houses in Five Row were built later as workers began to bring their families. Um, after construction was completed, Black workers tended to livestock, planted and harvested crops, and generally helped maintain the property. Uh, many of them worked as teamsters, working with um, a mule or a horse team pulling a plow. Um, they also drove mule teams to clear roads and spaces to build and improve on the estate. And this work of grading the land with mule teams continued on into the 1930s. Um, this is the indoor pool at Ronalda, which was an addition that was added by the Babcock family in 1935, 1936. And we have photographs of people still grading the land um, outside of the pool while it was under construction. So in addition to driving t a team, workers would upkeep roads, do landscaping, mow the grass, and on Saturdays, all men swept and raked around the lake. Um, workers' jobs included hauling coal to the heating plant, the rock quarry, and the blacksmith shop. Um, other miscellaneous jobs, including driving the bus and the night watchman. So now missing its uh, smokestack, the heating plant once provided steam heat for the farm buildings and houses on both sides of Ronaldo Road. Um, the plant used coal furnaces to generate heat, which was distributed through underground tunnels. Um, Ellis Pledger worked at the heating plant, firing the furnace with coal. Another job for black workers was cleaning out the underground tunnels. It was often an odd job for children who lived at Five Row. We have oral histories where kids talk about riding their bikes and playing in the tunnels. Um, this is a picture of the entrance of Ronaldo Village taken in 1916. So what was once the post office back here um, was once in the center of the village. It's now off to the side. I think it's um, all through the house now. Um, that was the building that served as the office for the farm superintendent, and it had a separate reading room for farm workers. Um, Catherine supplied up-to-date journals and books on agricultural practices. In the evenings, it functioned as a moonlight school for workers who wanted to further their education. And then right in the middle of the entrance here was a uh, water trough, and that is where the workers would gather to receive their jobs for the day. That's where they would line up to get their pay. So black employees typically were hired through a white referral. So, and once they were hired, they would often recommend their families for employment. So a good example of this is how the Wharton family came to Five Row. So brothers George, James, and Monroe came to Ronalda after A.C. Wharton was hired as the farm superintendent. Their father had been a sharecropper for A.C. Wharton's father on land that eventually became part of Tanglewood. Um, Buck, who was there on the right, was a mechanic. He drove the Ronaldo bus and he was a chauffeur for Catherine's second husband, J. Edward Johnston. His brothers worked on the farm. Um, in the 1930s, James became an underbutler for the Babcocks while Monroe and Buck worked for Dick Reynolds. Um, black employees worked throughout the village, the farm, the formal gardens, and at Ronaldo House. But the community of Five Row was located across the street separate from the rest of Ronaldo Village. Um, black workers would walk home by the blacksmith shop, cross the road, follow a path in the woods to a bridge across the creek, then be home in Five Row. So unlike the houses in Ronaldo Village, those in Five Row did not have electricity or running water. The houses were of board construction, while most of the residences in the village were made from stucco. 
Um, families made do with kerosene lamps and coal heaters. Water was drawn from several taps of well water. If you were lucky, you lived close enough to a water tap for the hose to reach your house. Um, so this way of living would have been viewed as normal for farm workers living in the country. However, it becomes unequal when you look at the full context of Catherine getting what is now Ronaldo Road paved. It was the first in the state. She worked with the electric company to get electricity all the way out here, and she could have provided it to Fibro if she had chosen to. Um, this is a picture of Samuel Stimson standing in Fibro. He's wearing his Carver High School band uniform. His parents, Luther and Mary Stimson, moved to Five Row in 1919. Uh, Luther helped grade the land, worked in the landscape department, and fired boilers in the steam plant. Um, Sam Stimson here, he grew up in Five Row, and then he did odd jobs like he raked and mowed lawns, and he performed maintenance work at the Ronaldo Church. So we don't have many pictures of the houses in Five Row, or really many images of Five Row at all. Uh, most of the images we do have were gathered in the 1990s by Gigi Parent when she curated the Spirit of Ronalda exhibition at Ronalda. She went in the community and talked to a lot of the descendants and people who were still alive and gathered some family pictures. So most of what we know about Fibro comes from oral histories of workers and their children. Uh, we know residents had their own flower and vegetable gardens and raised their own livestock, poultry, hogs, and milk cows. Uh, Ronaldo Farm provided milk and vegetables at wholesale prices. Um, this is Lily Hamlin on her porch in Five Row. Uh, she was married to Sam Davis and then later married to Lee Hamlin. Um, Lily Hamlin was never directly employed at Ronaldo, but her son San, Sam Hamlin wrote that she has done community work that is commendable. For often in case of sickness, she was both doctor and nurse. In case of misunderstanding, she was counselor and peacemaker. Um, these are two of Lily's sons, Paul Hamlin and Hugh Davis. Um, during high school, Hugh was friends with Smith Reynolds. Um, he later attended Howard University and worked for Dick Reynolds until the late 1930s. Um, Ed Lash grew up at Fibro with his family. His father, Jim Lash, started at the farm in 1912, working as a teamster, clearing the grounds, and later worked in the dairy. Uh, Jim first walked to Ronaldo from Bethania, then moved with his wife Cora to Five Row in 1918. They had nine children. Um, Ed Lash grew up and married Ida Lash. This is um, her here with one of their sons, Wayne Lash. Um, Ed Lash cleaned the underground tunnels, worked as a handyman at the Polo Club. Later, he worked for the Babcock family as a butler, and in 1949, he worked at Joe King's studio in Ronaldo Village. And Ed Lash, like many of the children who grew up at Ronalda, attended the Five Row School. So after R.J. Reynolds' death in 1918, Catherine embarked on a new project, uh, opening her own public school on the Ronalda estate. It was originally registered as a county school. Neighborhood children were able to attend for free, while family friends from outside the district paid tuition. So Catherine effectively went into the business of managing a public school. She designed the building, she hired the teachers, she helped create the curriculum, and she paid for supplies. And because of the racial inequalities of the time, there was a separate school at Five Row. Um, the school opened in 1918 with six students. Classes were held in the two-room building that also served as a church. They had the same curriculum and supplies as the Ronaldo School. Um, history, geography, spelling, grammar, painting, drawing. There was a music teacher um, and arithmetic were taught. Um, one student recalled learning about aviation. Lovey Eaton was the first teacher at Five Row and she later became principal. Uh, teachers at the school were educated at Hampton University, Bennett College, and Slater Academy. Uh, attendance at the Five Row School continued to grow. Some black families in town sent their children out to the Five Row School because it was believed to be better than the public schools in town. The Ronaldo School closed in 1923, but the school at Five Row operated another 20 years, closing sometime in the 1940s. Uh, not all of Ronaldo's black workers lived in Five Row. Residences in Ronaldo Village were given to John and Marjorie Carter here on the left, and to the chauffeur, Cleveland Williams, and his family. Cleve Williams is pictured here 
playing croquet on the front lawn with Smith and Nancy Reynolds. These employees occupied roles that were frequently needed at the house, which could partially explain why they were provided accommodation in the village. During Catherine's time, the domestic staff who worked in the house didn't live in Five Row. Wives of farm workers who lived in Five Row typically did not work at Renalda, focusing instead on raising their families and running their own households. However, these women did frequently take on occasional part-time or seasonal work, such as working in the laundry or helping out during hog killing season. Uh, later in the 1930s and 40s, during the Babcock years, some of the women worked as maids or cooks in the house. However, it appears that Catherine never hired women from Five Row to work on her domestic staff. We don't know exactly why. Um, was it these women chose not to work in domestic service? Um, I don't know, but we can't overlook that the backgrounds of the wives in Five Row were often quite different than that of the women hired to work in the house by Catherine. Um, so Catherine's domestic duties were enormous, but like many of her social class, she preferred challenges outside of the home. Um, Catherine hired both white and black domestic help. The most important positions of the black domestic staff included the head butler, the head cook, the upstairs maid, the switchboard operator, and the chauffeur. The top positions for the white domestic staff included Catherine's personal secretary, the children's nurse, and the governess. There was often a racial divide in these positions, but it wasn't necessarily a hard rule. Some of these positions were fluid. Um, there were white chauffeurs. There was a white switchboard operator. At one point, there was a black nurse. Um, the only positions that were always black were the male domestic staff that worked in the house and the maids. Um, the black employees that Catherine hired in the house were often educated, and many actually came from middle-class backgrounds themselves. Um, job duties were specialized by post, and each post was assigned a specific list of duties carefully crafted by Catherine. This is um, Catherine's handwritten instructions to the cook. So because of um, these instructions uh, that were left behind, in many ways we know what the daily life was like for the staff better than for the family. And once staff learned their post, Catherine gave them considerable responsibility and autonomy. For example, she authorized staff to purchase supplies they needed, and in her absence, they could make purchases on credit downtown. Um, domestic service was hard work, even at Rinalda. Service in the house began before daylight and could last well into the evening, and even overnight, leaving little time for their own families. We see in the instructions for the maid that she was expected to be on duty by 6 a.m. to awaken Catherine. Um, staff had two afternoons off each month and time on Sundays, except for their morning work that day, and if there happened to be visitors staying at Renata, they would be expected to work all day on Sundays as well. So often when you think of domestic staff, you think of live-in staff, but that was rarely the case in the South during this time period. At Renalda, the only domestics to live in the house were the governess and the nurses. Most of the domestic staff lived downtown and traveled from the city to Renalda and back. They took a streetcar for a nickel to the downtown post office, and then a bus that Catherine provided out to Renalda would pick them up. The bus had a daily schedule running from 6 in the morning until 11.30 at night. Um, you can see the fare was 10 cents for the Ronalda bus, and it's unclear if employees had to pay the 10 cent fare or if that was included as part of their employment. Um, I did find that the teachers at the Five Row School in the 1920s, their bus fare was actually paid for by Ronalda, but I couldn't find a comparable entry like that for the domestic staff, so it's assumed that they had to pay that 10 cent fare every day. So some of the black house staff lived in the ser servant's cottage, which was located kind of behind the house. You'll pass it as you drive out of Renalda. It was initially given to John Carter, the head butler, and his wife Marjorie, but they did not live there long before moving to their, to their own home on 7th Street. It was never intended to be the Carter's house for their own use in the way that other houses in the village were given to what was almost exclusively white employees. Um, the Carters would have been expected to house any members of staff who needed to stay late or be at work early, and after the Carters moved out, that was how the cottage was used for any domestic staff that needed overnight accommodations. John Carter, the butler, was who really kept Ronaldo running on a daily basis. 
Before he was butler, John Carter worked in the tobacco factory during the day and would act as a valet for RJ at night. But Catherine soon began to depend on him more and more, and he eventually became butler at their house on Fifth Street and stayed through the move to Ronalda and remained as butler until his death in 1955. Um, although he could neither read nor write very well, both family members and other workers said that he was the one that ran the house. Even Nancy Reynolds said, he really bossed all of us, particularly after mother died. He'd tell us what to do, he ran the house, and that was it. Um, like other staff positions, Catherine wrote out what she expected from the butler. He was to act as a valet to RJ and any visiting male guest, keep the first floor clean, polish the silver. And during this time period, the dining room became an important space, second only to the drawing room or reception hall and communicating status and taste. And at Ronalda, it was the butler's job to oversee the setting of the table and to serve the family and guests. And this art around dining led to the rise in the number of male domestic staff. So having men as part of your domestic staff was a way to indicate your status and wealth. Marjorie Carter was the wife of John Carter. She started as a laundress and then became an upstairs maid. Um, the upstairs maid cleaned the bedrooms, dealt with the linens, and acted as what we would think of as a lady's maid. Um, like several women employed by Catherine in the house, Marjorie was a college graduate. Uh, later, Marjorie became the cook. The cook had especially demanding hours during um, Catherine's time. So Catherine expected breakfast at 6.45, dinner at 12.40, and supper at 6. Um, the cook was to prepare all meals and was expected to cook enough for the staff as well. And that was one thing that was unique to Ronaldo, having staff eat what the family ate. We, f we found out in the oral histories that other prominent families in the areas would expect the cook to prepare something different for their staff, typically something cheaper or something that was canned. So a member of the staff who sort of helped protect Catherine's time was a switchboard operator. Uh, Elizabeth Wade worked in that role the longest. She attended Bennett College. And during the summer, she would come work at Renata with her aunt. She started out in the laundry before becoming a maid. Uh, Catherine was so impressed with her work that she promoted her to switchboard operator. Um, after she married, Elizabeth Wade quit Renata, but she later came back and worked as a governess for Dick Reynolds. In her oral history, Elizabeth Wade talks about being white passing. She described having to ride on a Jim Crow train car and how awful and hot it was that when she changed trains, she decided to pass and ride the rest of the way on the white car. She also shared how she was asked to pass by Dick Reynolds while she was working for him. Um, that was when they traveled. They would go to places that she couldn't as a black woman, even though she was with the kids, like on the plane or to the beach. And Dick Reynolds would tell her, um, you're not black now, you're white. Uh, she was interviewed in 1980, and she doesn't get into how that made her feel, but the idea of having to discard a part of your identity certainly left an impression. She was still processing almost 50 years later when she was interviewed. Uh, Savannah Webster Jones is an interesting member of Catherine's staff. She was mostly a seamstress here, but she did sometimes work the switchboard. Um, what makes her interesting is because she worked in domestic service because she wanted to. She was married to Charles Henry Jones, a black real estate entrepreneur, and she was rather well off herself, but she was bored and she liked to make dresses, so she would come out to Ronalda and work as a seamstress making clothes for Catherine and her daughters. So Catherine hired all of her staff herself. She did use an agency to find people, but similar to how staffing happened on the farm, she depended on the recommendations of her current staff. So Catherine would go through her staff's family rather than pick a stranger. Um, Catherine would trust her staff to bring in someone that was reliable. Um, there are several examples of domestic staff working their entire careers at Ronalda which was unusual for domestic service. The typical time for most domestics to work for a particular family was three to six months. Um, but Catherine did have high expectations and if they weren't being met, she would let a staff member go. Uh, Ronaldo's first farm superintendent only lasted about a year when his weekly reports weren't detailed enough for Catherine. Um, 
Probably the saddest example of a firing was Lula Hairston. She worked um, as a nurse and a maid with the family when they were living at the Fifth Street house. I think this is a picture of her. Uh, Catherine was very fond of her and gave her some time off so that she could have time for a rest. Instead, um, Lula began moonlighting for another family, which was not the done thing at the, at the time. You, you weren't supposed to go and work for another family, and another family wasn't supposed to hire staff who worked for someone else. Um, we don't know why Lula took this position. I mean, most likely because she needed the money. There's a letter in the archive that Lula wrote asking Catherine for a loan. So um, money problems were a consistent issue for her. But Catherine found out about the second job and fired her. Um, Lula begged Catherine for her job back, but she said, no, you let me down. Um, after Catherine's death in 1924, um, the four Reynolds children were often away at school, only coming back to Renalda for holidays and vacations. In 1934, Mary and her husband, Charlie Babcock, purchased Renalda from her siblings. The Babcocks still lived full-time in Connecticut, but Mary wanted to make some changes at Renalda, so she planned some renovations that would leave Renalda's character intact, but would infuse it with some modern flair. She added the bar and the recreation spaces in the basement, the indoor pool, and she converted the parking circle into the forecourt garden. So many of the staff that worked for Catherine and those who had grown up in Five Row continued to be employed by either the Babcock family or, for, or by Dick Reynolds. Um, Harvey Miller was the butler during the Babcock years. Um, Harvey actually grew up in Five Row after his parents, Henry and Mamie Miller, came to Rinalda in 1922. His father worked on the farm and was one of the mule teamsters. Harvey started out doing odd jobs on the estate. He helped in the garage, he caddied on the golf course, and he eventually trained under John Carter to become the butler for the Babcocks. He would work at Rinalda and would travel with the family when they, when they were living in Connecticut. And he actually continued to work at Rinalda after it became a museum, and he worked there until he retired in 1982. So in 1980, the Ronaldo Oral History Project interviewed Reynolds family members and estate workers and their descendants. And through these interviews, we get a glimpse of what it was like to live and work at Ronaldo, and we get to hear about the perceptions of their work in their own words. Um, Harvey talked about the long hours. He said, I didn't work by the hour. You'd start and stop. You had a starting point, but not too much of a getting off point. I was here all the time. I'd come here in the morning at 8, 8 o'clock, 7.30, and would stay until everything was finished. But Harvey also made the point that being the employee of such a, an established and well-regarded Winston-Salem family helped soften race relations when dealing with other white people in Winston-Salem. Um, the Pacific example that Harvey used was that white store owners were far more willing to extend him credit than to other black men because he was known to work for the Reynolds family. Um, Harvey's wife, Rosalie Miller, worked for the family as a kitchen maid and later an upstairs maid. She called the job a steady one, one she could depend on, but admitted that while the Babcocks thought they were paying staff higher wages, it still really wasn't much money. Um, when Catherine was alive and later with the Babcocks, more and more people were leaving domestic work for factory jobs, but some, like Rosalie, believed that domestic work was more dependable, that in the factory your hours could be cut, as a domestic, you were provided all of your work clothes and board when you were at work. If you were sick or you needed to see a doctor or have a procedure, the Babcocks would pay for that. So the lifestyle enjoyed by the Reynolds and Babcock families was made possible by domestic staff that were doing the work mostly in the background. When reflecting on working for the Babcocks, Harvey Miller said, Mary didn't say my servants, it was her staff. They didn't tell you to do so and so, they asked you and said thank you. They had respect for us and we had respect for them. I'll put it that way. Uh, when the Babcocks purchased Ronalda in the 1930s, they had little interest in the farm operations. The farm was sort of left to struggle along and was operated by Ronalda Inc., which was overseen by the bank. Uh, the landscape of Winston-Salem was also changing and there was a significant decrease in opportunities for farm workers. Uh, Mary's remodel of the house and the construction of Old Town Club brought a brief resurgence in work opportunities, but many residents of Five Row feared they would soon have to abandon their homes and the community they had formed. 
1940, Sam Hamlin, who grew up in Fyro, his mother was Lily Hamlin, he wrote a pictorial essay entitled The Negro and Ronaldo to give to the Babcock family. It was disguised as a history of black contributions to Ronaldo, but what it really was was a plea to the Babcocks to continue providing employment and housing for the men and women who had contrib contributed so much to Ronaldo. So Hamlin wrote his essay with a sense of nostalgia. He wrote, there is nothing dearer to the human heart than the things one has helped to make. This being the case, we can truthfully say there is nothing dearer to, dearer to the Negro at Ronaldo than Ronaldo itself. For it is the Ronaldo that Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds dreamed of, planned, built, and perfected as a landmark and home for many of our people. But buried in the sentimentality was a shrewd observation of life at Ronaldo. Hamlin, who later became a teacher and activist, pointed out the lack of job opportunities, a decline in wages, and the absence of electricity and telephones in five row, despite those utilities now being easily accessible. This is an aerial shot of Ronalda, and you can just glimpse five row up here in the upper corner. So despite this decrease in jobs, five row continued on as a community. In the 1950s, electricity finally came to Five Row, but around 1960, Five Row was demolished for the building of Silas Creek Parkway. During a pu push for urban renewal, a time in which various levels of white majority government raised traditionally black neighborhoods and replaced them with new roads and highways beneath a veneer of progress. Some current residents of Five Row chose to purchase their home and they used those materials to help build their new houses. Uh, Flora Pledger successfully petitioned Charlie Babcock to pay for the relocation of the church building. It existed through about the early 2000s in its new location, but it was recently um, torn completely down. So thank you for learning about Five Row at Ronaldo today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're